all right, CC Sears, uh, Ford GT40. You know, with all these cars, when you're out driving them, it's important to know how to operate them, but you also got to know the story, and you're not going to get away with driving this car around New York City and not getting blasted the question. So a little bit of history, and then we'll get to showing you actually how this thing works. Um, so this car, probably one of the most, if not the most famous car in motorsport history, and it was born out of a great story of motorsport and business rivalry. So early 60s, word, word was out that Ferrari might be looking to sell. Uh, Henry Ford uh, put a, several million dollars into some due diligence looking to buy a Ferrari, and he was gonna move forward with the deal at the last minute when he, when he told Enzo that he couldn't be the head of motorsport and he didn't want Ferraris competing with Fords on American soil. Ferrari pulled the deal, and one of the biggest business and, and motorsport rivalries blew out of it. Uh, Ford's answer to that was if he couldn't buy Ferrari, he was gonna go beat Ferrari at that race, at their own race. So they had been dominating Le Mans for, for a long time. And he said, I'm gonna build a car that'll beat those guys at Le Mans. And that's exactly what he did. Ford GT40, 1966, 67, 68, and 69, won Le Mans. And ours is paying homage, this is a replica, of course. We don't have the real one, it would be several millions, if not tens of millions of dollars. Ours is a replica of the chassis 1075 that won two years in a row, 68 and 69, in the Gulf livery. So a really important car, really awesome you know, motorsport history. And you know, while it is a replica, it's built really true to the spirit of the original, same kind of motor and, and uh, chassis. And it's as close as you'll ever get to driving one of these you know, multi-million dollar uh, 60s Le Mans cars, especially on the road. It's an awesome experience. Um, we'll take you a little closer and have a look and show you everything works. Again, just a bit more about what it's got. People are gonna say, what engine does it have? This has a built up Ford Racing 302. The later cars uh, in Le Mans were you know, 4.9 liters, so 289. So it's, again, true to the spirit of the motor, the original car. Properly built though, you know, unlike most American V8s, this thing does rev a fair amount. It'll go, you know, six or six and a half thousand RPM. Um, it's got uh, four down, two barrel downdraft Weber carburetors on it, so you get this real kind of classic vintage, uh, you know, clack sound when you get on the throttle. We'll, we'll, we'll hear that in a minute. quickly basic stuff fuel caps on the outside just flip that up and go straight down the tank um, there's one on each side they are separate tanks they need to be filled separately um, you know the, this filler does a 90 degree turn directly below here so you don't want to pour fuel in too quickly it will kind of gurgle up you got to take it easy and go slowly so even if you're in New Jersey and the guys are trying to pump it for you get out and try to help them so they don't they don't flood the things with, with gas now we're gonna take you inside and show you how everything else works. So this car far and away is gonna be the most unique driving experiences you have at the club. Um, with that, you know, everything about it is a bit different, requires uh, a bit of handling. And, you know, it's not, it's not the car to, you know, take the fiance for a romantic weekend away, you know, to the beach. There's no luggage space. It's hard, fast, loud, uncomfortable. It's everything, like, everything that makes a sports car good. This is the most extreme part of it. So. Take it on an occasion where you can just go out for a day, you know, with a friend or someone who's really into this stuff and go driving some great roads up to Bear Mountain and bring it back. The, the weekend trip in this car would be a brave move. It can be done, but just know what you're getting in for. Um, getting into it, massive sills. The fuel tanks are on both sides, so you have to step over the fuel tank to get in. That's why the doors are cut out so far. When it comes to starting it, this is your... Um, security system, there's no locks. So this is the, the battery kill switch and you put it in here, turn it to the right to give the car power. Put the key in up here, turn it, 
to finish getting powder, and then you hit the start button. You know, starting from cold, you turn the key, make sure your fuel pump's on, you'll hear the pump go, and uh, just hit the start button, and maybe one pump of the gas when it's cold, and then kind of feather the gas to catch it. You really do have to manage the equipment here. Uh, a good friend of ours runs, used to run a business called Sail Time, and when he did our orientation, he gave me a really good phrase. He said, you're the captain of your vessel, and that means you have to take care of knowing everything that's going on in the car and, uh, and, and know what you're operating. So you do have to manage things as you go. There's a whole array of toggle switches here. All of them are off in the up position, so just to run you through them quickly, You've got fan, which is a cooling fan. That should come on on its own, uh, but this is an override to force it to come on. So if you saw the temperature getting over 90 degrees Celsius and the, and, uh, the fan wasn't coming on, which would be indicated by this yellow light here, you can flip that down and turn it on. Hazard lights, pretty self-explanatory. AC, um, so this is AC cooling and heat. So up is heat, the middle is vent, down is AC. Um, and then this dial here is to do the fan control to blow the air around. Um, AC works, it's actually really cold, but it, there's no regulation of temperature. So I find you'll put it on AC and you'll end up toggling back and forth between uh, AC and vent just to manage the temperature. Lights, um, up is off, middle is parking, down is headlights. Um, there's high beams and blinkers on the stock. Fuel, you have two separate fuel tanks, each with their own pump. Um, so again, up is off, middle is the driver's side tank and pump, and down is the passenger side tank and pump. Without uh, that on, you have no fuel, so <laughs> yeah, you have to always be in the middle or down position when you're running the car. Uh, wipers, um, just you know, different wiper speeds. Probably something you'll never have to use in this car because it's not something you want to be driving in the rain. Um, over here, there's a windshield washer and horn button is up there, so keep, keep that in mind that your horn's there. So rear view mirror, uh, pretty pointless. I'm just looking at the velocity stacks in the motor. You can't see anything out the back of this car. So when the ignition's on, you push this button and a little rear view display will come up. We have a, a rear view camera. Um, it's actually pretty useful just going down the highway knowing what's around you because the, these mirrors are pretty limited and the visibility in the back is non-existent. Uh, gearbox, it's a six speed gearbox, you know, normal H pattern. Um, reverse is up and to the left as well, and it's right next to first. So I find the best way to not end up accidentally reverse is to pull down into second first and then just go straight up. Um, the clutch is like an on-off switch. It's a pretty heavy racing clutch, and there's basically no way to pull away smoothly. You just have to kind of commit to it, and maybe give it a, a little feather of the gas just to keep it running. Um, there's a few more things to keep in mind once it is running. Um, the alternator is underdriven, so at an idle, if you look at the volt gauge here, you know, you have to be 12 volts or higher to be charging the battery. And at an idle with some accessories on, this will drop down to 10. Um, so the best thing to do if, you're in, if you do get stuck in some traffic, you're sitting at a stoplight for a minute, you always want to be thrown in neutral when you're in stop and go traffic anyways. And just give it a few revs once in a while to bring up the RPM and, and get some charge in the battery. Um, it is possible to run the battery dead with the car running at idle, so you do have to manage that a bit. Once you're on the road and moving and you're, you're up you know, in the higher RPMs, it'll be charging fine, it's not a problem. Um, but it's deliberately underdriven, so it won't burn up at higher RPM. Um, that's about it, really. You know, Take your time to get oriented with it. It's a lot of car to take in. It's going to feel really foreign, especially getting out of the uh, city in traffic and you know, tight corners and low visibility. But once you get out on the open road, it's actually a pretty, pretty nice car to drive. Everything's solid, direct, you know, it doesn't shake around. You, you, can, you can manage it pretty well, but, but you know, get yourself ready for it. Get in that motorsport spirit. Um, remember, this is, this, is, this is a serious bit of equipment, so you want to be serious about how you approach driving it and be deliberate with everything you're doing. You know, nothing too abrupt. There's no traction control, no ABS, nothing to save you if you go wrong. So you really want to be smooth, you know, break the car in a straight line, get it settled, dial in steering, and only start squeezing on the gas when you can see you out of the corner, and do only squeeze on the gas. This thing weighs probably something sub 2,500 pounds and has, you know, 450 horsepower V8 in the back. So if you do boot the throttle, um, even just 
quarter to half throttle quickly, it's going to step out the back end, and you, you don't want to be caught out with that. So, so respect respect the machinery and know what you're getting into, but enjoy it. It's going to be an awesome ride.